let's open it up for questions. Um, anyone online, if you'd like to raise your hand, or there are a few people in the room here. I have a, I have a question. Yes. Um, so if I understand the idea right, it's you're basically using a quantum computer to get a very accurate density. That's right. And can jump potential. Like, did you actually try? Is it like at the moment just a theoretical concept, or did you compare with some results from conventional like inversions of CI oh. densities and things? Yeah, good question. Um, so the the state of quantum computing right now is is that um, all of the qubits are noisy. So in your cell phone, sometimes one of the the bits that you receive is an error. Yeah. And so this is sort of the foundations of Shannon information theory is, is that how do you account for these errors? And essentially what you do is you implement an error correction scheme. So in your cell phone, there's an error correction scheme to say, this one looks wrong, I'm going to flip it and then mm -hmm. do this. And we have really good error correction schemes. Right now on quantum computers, we lack uh, good implementations of um, uh, error correction. So what you need to do is you need to generate a topological state of matter. You then need to um, use that topological state of matter to make something such that when you perform an operation that is inside, you know, you, you perform some noise operation that it doesn't then destroy the the, cube, the logical qubit state that exists there. So the the current state of quantum computers, every demonstration that you see, is basically they say we have a really noisy machine, an individual answer is probably wrong, so let's just run it a bunch of times and take the average. Okay. And this is fine for the near term and for pleasing funding agencies and things, but we really needed to look at long term, where's quantum computing going to be in the next 10 years? And that's really where these techniques lie. Um, having said that, uh, the so I didn't compare cone channel potentials because I didn't have access to a quantum computer, but about a month after I published the Green Selection paper, there was an experimental group in the UK somewhere I don't remember. Sorry, sorry if you're watching this. Um, but uh, um, they they did exactly the length shows stuff out to a few coefficients on the quantum computer, and then they cited my paper. I was very excited. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, you know, like I said, this this these these techniques are not going to supplant what anyone is doing in the near future. Um, you can only do size two and four, four if you're lucky, um, systems in order to get results. Okay. And the coherence times on these things are, you know, a couple hundred, a couple, you know, hundred microseconds. So you really can't do many operations. And, and you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in order to you know, actually do it. But if I wanted to do like a limited example, sure, I could compare the, you know, the coach have potential for a, a Hubbard diver. <laughs> Something like this. But this isn't very compelling, so I didn't get rid of it. Yeah, exactly. I'm curious, follow up on, on this. I'm curious. Um, I mean, right, I mean, like the actual quantum hardware is hard to access and it's very limited. What about emulators? Okay. Do you think, I mean, it's expensive, right, to emulate, Yeah. but you could go up, I mean, you might go, You. that's maybe easier accessible than that's you right. just need a big cluster. Would you think this is feasible for so these so kind of questions? That's right. Yeah, I, and that's what I'm working on right now. Is, um, so I have this Tensor Network Library, DMR Julia, that uh, it's, it, it just got uh, published as a package on the Julia repository uh, as DMRJ Tensor because they don't... Uh, if you put Julia in the title, then they don't like the name. So, <laughs> okay. but um, so uh, yeah. So with tensor network methods, you can shrink the, the bond dimension down, and you can then simulate these these uh, quantum computing operations and, and then perform basically everything. Um, but I don't find it to be as useful. It's like I almost see it as like a magic trick. Like you're basically saying, okay, you don't like see the theory. But here's a practical implementation. It's like you know. Like it's not the actual quantum computing results, but it's simulating the quantum computing results. So I don't find it as useful as a, as a demonstration. Um, thing is like showing that incrementally adding terms of the Langshus thing. I think that's useful, but um, you know, I think someone can always come in and question like, well, how do you know that the quantum computer is going to act exactly like that? And it's like you're 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 twisting the you know how how confident we are in quantum physics based in Schrodinger's equation. Um, and I, I just, I don't know. A lot, the other thing is that the, the way that I wrote the papers was just sort of in line with what is in the field. And there's sort of just a lot of open theory that is done. Um, 
uh, and I, I trust my my colleague David, uh, who introduced a lot of those those tools. So, um, I, but it, it's probably coming these emulation things. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. That's a question, uh, Leonard. Thank you for for the talk. Um, so I've been working a little bit on on V wave systems. So and and you only showed um, quantum gate operations. So have you also worked on, on quantum annealer, annealer somehow? Yeah. Because they, they are a lot larger and not so noisy as the quantum gate computers at the moment. Yeah, my, my next position is in British Columbia, so I'm probably going to have to run into these, these D-Wave things. Um, uh, that's right. So we this is largely influenced by just you know the person who introduced me to the field just wanted to use gate-based operations. Um, I think a lot of the algorithms in the literature are also written in terms of gates. Um, I, I, there's, I, I think it would be possible to rewrite everything in terms of so that it would be useful on a quantum annealer, but uh, um, I just haven't done it yet. Uh, but it's a, it's a good suggestion. I should uh, yeah, think, about it. think about extending if it needs to be extended. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Maybe I'll ask one. Sure. Um, more about like there were a few things. That, not everything was clear to me. And, sure. Sure. But, but, and I was curious about the quantum counting. Um, sure. I it went too fast for me, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Is the sort of quantum counting because on on the on a later circuit diagram, it looked to me like yeah, quantum phase estimation and quantum. It's, um, it's quantum accounting. Uh, quantum counting. QC is, has a big degeneracy. It's like quantum chemistry, quantum computing, quantum counting. Yes. What I mixed up, or what is not so clear to me, is so the quantum phase estimation. Uh, I misunderstood. So I thought, so the quantum metropolis sampling, is that is that used for both for quantum phase estimation and quantum oh, counting? So, so quantum phase estimation is separate. So, so quantum 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 QMA sampling uh, is is this QAE step. Okay. No, okay. no one's quite okay. sure what to call this. So, I just I decided David would always refer to it as quantum counting. Uh, but there is another version of quantum counting that's like the Grover search. Um, but you know we're, we're obviously like starting from a wave function, applying an operator, and then we're counting the number of times that we recovered that same wave function. So we, I, he always called it quantum counting. I, it, when I write it in papers, I say state preserving quantum counting, and that's based on the quantum metropolis. And then it's, it's exactly it's a, it's a, okay. exactly an implementation okay. of the quantum metropolis uh, uh, sampling, uh, the the QMA sampling. Um, but maybe just to go over the. Uh, uh, the, the the quantum counting in a slightly different way. Oops. I think it's here. Okay, so basically, when I apply an operator to a wave function, I'm not guaranteed to get back into the same eigenstate. Uh, I can I, I can get there with a probability of the expectation. This is the expectation value of O on psi. Uh, just you can evaluate that by just taking the dual of the vector and then, and then going through. Now, um, the perpendicular space, though, is all of the other eigenstates in the, in the Hilbert space in the, in the energy eigenbasis uh, that I could possibly get. And so just by counting going from one to the other. Um, so it's actually, I think, a little bit even more simple when you apply this onto quantum chemistry than it is on the, the metropolis sampling. Um, you, you, have, you, you use this oblivious amplitude amplification to apply the operator onto the wave function. It basically guarantees that you you get this, um, but then uh, you get the original wave function back uh, with some uh, expectation value, um, and then uh, and then you have these either you either restart with the same wave function or you uh, um, uh, have to recover it. But those are basically the only two operations that would be used here. Krishna has a question. Uh, hi, Thomas. Hi. Uh, so I just have a question about uh, what kind of uh, uh, 
uh, points did you consider before you were about uh, to going about designing the ANSATs? So was it going about the uh, chemically inspired approach, like the unitary couple cluster, single double, which is pretty famously used, or did you have to go around these things, or how did what points did you actually consider while designing your ANSATs? Yeah, so I, I think correct me if I'm wrong, but you're 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 thinking that um, on the, for the variational quantum eigen solver, which is yes. right now, um, uh, you have to choose a parameterization of the wave function. Exactly. And some some people uh, choose to use the uh, couple cluster onset, so they they have this parameter theta, and it basically parameterizes mm -hmm. how many of these singles, doubles, and quadruple excitations. Um, yeah, so I, I don't use the variational quantum eigen solver here. Um, so just to you know throw some cold water on it, I think it's a good near-term application of these things. But I, I will just point out that that update of those of the parameters and the onsats in the classical computer, you can formally prove that it's MP hard, which you know that's that's a very hard problem to do in general. Um, so you, you basically have no free, you know, the, the quantum computer in that case is only evaluating the expectation values in whatever uh, um, thing you have, but you still have the hard work of Op actually optimizing those those parameters. So um, I didn't use that here because I actually want to recover the full wave function. The other reason that I didn't use it is um, uh, the means to update the wave function. If I've had a fully quantum error corrected quantum computer, uh, it'd be much, much better to use these Langshus based, method, based methods because they're, they're so rapidly convergent um, uh, that I wouldn't uh, sort of need to uh, uh, pay much, pay much attention to it. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Though. Mm, one question, maybe one more thing is sure. on the is kind of when you go to the continued attraction representation. Yeah. Something that confused me was a plot. I didn't quite understand. Is if you go to the next slide. Your results, yeah. Sure. I got confused with the x-axis that labels the terms, mm -hmm. and then the Langshaw's method with two and four. Sure. Um, this refers to the levels in the continued fraction, uh, or or the number of coefficients. This is just to obtain the ground state. So the idea is, can you start with some bare Hamiltonian, which is just an xy model in this case, so just a one-dimensional tensile uh, xy model. And if I then add in the uh, ZZ term, uh, there are nine of those that I need to add in. So if I add the first one and I run the Langshaw's algorithm for two times, then then I get basically the oh, oh I see the yeah. the, uh, the correct answer. And if I run it for four, I get a slightly better answer. But then you can sort of see the, the propagation of the errors. Oh, I misread this graph. So yeah. the x-axis are different problems. So different right. model systems. Yeah. For which you all recover. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I was adding in the next interaction term on the chain. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, this, this is just confusing. Okay. Yeah. And you were kind of seeing already convergence, or I mean, already with two Langshaw's coefficients. Yes. You have yeah. very so accurate results, and you could improve if you go. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Not on the classical computer. It turns out that you get the, the uh, errors accumulate very, very quickly. So you, you actually wind up with energies that are lower than this line if you go to six or something. Awesome. Um, uh, that's both because the inaccuracy of the initial starting wave function, but then also the accumulated uh, errors that appear here. But that should not appear on the class on the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm limited to these these uh, these things. So you can see, like for the random side, I couldn't run one and two mm -hmm. because it wouldn't. It wasn't variational <laughs> anymore. The, the beta coefficients um, mm. lose accuracy too quickly. And related to this, so when you define your Krilov subspace, are you? I'm not very familiar with the method. So are you free to choose any basis set? You, um, could could you do this like on a real space grid, for example, yes. or in terms of basis functions of your choice? Yes. So you're yeah, no in problem. that sense open mm -hmm. to choose. Any representation that is convenient. That's right. Okay. You might just have to. I think the only thing you have to take into account is if you're using a non-orthogonal basis set. I think you just have to solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. yeah. Okay. Any any other questions? Any final questions for Thomas? All right. Then.
If not, then thanks again for your talk and for the discussion. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate it.